under the regents, the hooded hand. Cregan Stark had stepped down as Hand of the King and announced his intention to return to Winterfell. But before he could take his leave of the South, he faced a thorny problem. Lord Stark had marched south with a great host, made up in large part of men unwanted and unneeded in the North, whose return would bring great hardship and mayhaps even death for the loved ones they had left behind. Legend, and Mushroom, tells us that it was Lady Alysanne who suggested an answer. The lands along the Trident were full of widows, she reminded Lord Stark. Women, many burdened with young children, who had set their husbands off to fight with one lord or another only for them to fall in battle. With winter at hand, strong backs and willing hands would be welcome in many a hearth and home. In the end, more than a thousand Northmen accompanied Black Alley and her nephew Lord Benjicott when they returned to the Riverlands after the royal wedding. A wolf for every widow, Mushroom japed. He will warm her bed in winter and gnaw her bones come spring. Yet hundreds of marriages were made at the so-called widow fairs held at Raven Tree, River Run, Stony Sept, The Twins, and fair market. Those Northmen who did not wish to marry, instead, swore their swords to lords both great and small. As guards and men-at-arms, a few, sad to say, did turn to outlawry and met evil ends. But for the most part, Lady Alysanne's matchmaking was a great success. The resettled Northmen not only strengthened the river lords who welcomed them, particularly House Tully, and House Blackwood, but also helped revive and spread the worship of the old god south of the Neck. Other northerners chose to seek new lives and fortunes across the narrow sea. A few days after Lord Stark stepped down as Hand of the King, Sir Marston Waters returned alone from Liz, whence he had been sent to hire sellswords. He gladly accepted a pardon for his past crimes and reported that the Triarchy had collapsed. On the point of war, the three daughters were hiring free companies as fast as they could form, at wages he could not hope to match. Many of Lord Cregan's Northmen saw this as an opportunity. Why return to a land gripped by winter to freeze or starve when there was gold to be had across the narrow sea? Not one, but two free companies were birthed as a result. The Wolf Pack, commanded by Hollis Hornwood, called Mad Hal, and Timothy Snow, the bastard of Flint's finger, was made up entirely of Northmen, whilst the Stormbreakers, financed and led by Sir Oscar Tully, included men from every part of Westeros. Even as these adventurers prepared to take their leave of King's Landing, others were arriving from every point of the compass for Prince Egon's coronation and the royal wedding. From the west, came Lady Johanna Lannister and her father, Roland Westerling, Lord of the Crag. From the south, two score high towers from Old Town, led by Lord Lionel and the redoubtable Lady Samantha, his father's widow. Though forbidden to wed, their passion for one another had become common knowledge by this time, and so a great scandal that the High Septum refused to travel with them. Arriving three days later in the company of the Lord's Redwine, Costain, and Beesbury. Lady Elenda, the widow of Lord Boros, remained at Storm's End with her infant son, but sent her daughters, Cassandra, Ellen, and Floris to represent House Baratheon. Morris, the fourth daughter, had joined the Silent Sisters, Septim Eustace informs us. In Mushroom's account, this was done after her lady mother had her tongue removed. But that grisly detail can be safely discounted. The persistent belief that the Silent Sisters are tongueless is no more than a myth. It is piety that keeps the sisters silent, not red-hot pincers. Lady Baratheon's father, Royce Caron, Lord of Nightsong and Lord of the Marches, escorted the girls to the city and would remain with them as their guardian. Alan Valerian came ashore as well, and the Manderley brothers returned once more from White Harbor with a hundred knights in blue-green cloaks. 
even from across the narrow sea they came, from Bravos and Pentos, all three of the daughters, old Volantis. From the summer isles appeared three tall black princes in feathered cloaks, whose splendor was a wonder to behold. Every inn and stable in King's Landing was soon full, whilst outside the walls, a city of tents and pavilions arose for those unable to find accommodations. A great deal of drinking and fornication took place, claims Mushroom. A great deal of prayer and fasting and good works, reports Septim Eustace. The tavern keepers of the city waxed fat and happy for a time, as did the whores of Flea Bottom and their sisters in the fine houses along the street of Silk, though the common people complained about the noise and stink. A desperate, fragile air of forced fellowship hung over King's Landing in the days leading up to the wedding. For many of those crowding cheek by jowl into the city's wine sinks and pot shops had stood upon opposite sides of battlefields a year ago. If only blood can wash out blood, King's Landing was full of the unwashed, says Mushroom. Yet there was less fighting in the streets than most expected, with only three men killed. Mayhaps the lords of the realm had finally grown weary of war. With the dragon pit still largely in ruins, the wedding of Prince Egon and Princess Jehera was celebrated out of doors. At the top of Visenya's hill, where towering grand stands were erected so the men and women of the nobility might sit in comfort and enjoy an unobstructed view. The day was cold, but sunny, Septim Eustace records. It was the seventh day of the seventh moon of the 131st year after Egon's conquest, a most auspicious date. The High Septum of Old Town performed the rites himself, and a deafening roar went up from the small folk when His High Holiness declared the Prince and Princess won. Tens of thousands packed the streets cheering Egon and Jahera as they were carried in an open litter up to the Red Keep, where the Prince was crowned with a circlet of yellow gold, simple and unadorned, and proclaimed Egon of House Targaryen the third of his name. King of the Andals, the Royer, and the First Men, and Lord of the Seven Kingdoms. Egon himself placed the crown upon the head of his child bride. Though a solemn boy, the new king was undeniably handsome. Lean of face and form, with silver white hair and purple eyes, whilst the queen was a beautiful child. Their wedding was as lavish a spectacle as the Seven Kingdoms had seen since the coronation of Egon II in the Dragon Pit. All that was lacking were dragons. There would be no triumphal flight around the city walls for this king, no majestic descent upon the castle yard, and the more observant made note of another absence. The Dowager Queen was nowhere to be seen, though as Jahera's grandmother, Alison Hightower ought to have been present. As he was still but ten years of age, the new king's first act was to name the men who would protect and defend him and rule for him until he came of age. Sir Willis Fell, the sole survivor of the Kingsguard of King Viserys's time, was made Lord Commander of the White Swords, with Sir Marston Waters as his second. As both men were considered greens, the remaining places in the Kingsguard were filled with blacks. Sir Tyland Lannister, recently returned from Mere, was made Hand of the King, whilst Lord Leowen Corbray was named Protector of the Realm. The former had been a green, the latter a black. Over them would sit a council of regency, consisting of Lady J.N. Arryn of the Vale, Lord Coralus Valerian of Driftmark, Lord Rollin Westerling of the Crag, Lord Royce Caron of Nightsong, Lord Manfred Moonton of Maidenpool, Sir Torin Manderley of White Harbor, and Grand Maester Munkin, newly chosen by the Citadel to take up Grand Maester Orwile's chain of office. It is reliably reported that Lord Cregan Stark was also offered a place amongst the regents, but refused. Conspicuous omissions from the council included Kermit Tully, Unwin Peak, Sabbath Afray, Thaddeus Rowan, Lionel Hightower, Johanna Lannister, and Benji Cott Blackwood, but Septim Eustace insists that only Lord Peak was truly angered by his exclusion.
This was a council of which Septim Eustace heartily approved. Six strong men, and one wise woman, seven to rule us here on earth, as the seven above rule all men from their heaven. Mushroom was less impressed. Seven regents were six too many, he said. Pity is our poor king. Despite the fool's misgivings, most observers seemed to feel that the reign of King Agon III had begun on a hopeful note. The remainder of the year 131 AC was a time of departures, as the great lords of Westeros took their leaves of King's Landing, one by one, to return to their own seats of power. Amongst the first to flee were two of the three widows who were present. After bidding tearful farewells to their daughters, sons, siblings, and cousins, who would remain to serve the new king and queen as companions and hostages. With Lady Sam went her paramour, Lord Lionel, riding south for Old Town with the High Towers, whilst Lord Rowan, Beesbury, Costain, Tarley, and Redwine joined to escort His High Holiness to the same destination. Cregan Stark led his much-diminished host north along the King's Road within a fortnight of the coronation. Three days later, Lord Blackwood and Lady Alisane set out for Raventree with a thousand of Stark's northerners as his tail. Lord Kermit Tully and his knights returned to Riverrun whilst his brother, Sir Oscar, set sail with his stormbreakers for Tyrosh and the disputed lands. There was one who did not depart as planned, however. Sir Medric Manderley had agreed to take the men bound for the wall as far as White Harbor on his galley, North Star. From there, they were to proceed overland to Castle Black. On the morning, the North Star was to sail, however. Accounts of the condemned revealed a man was missing. Grand Maester Orwile, it seemed, had experienced a change of heart as regarded taking the black. Bribing one of his guards to loose his fetters, he had changed into a beggar's rags and disappeared into the stews of the city. Unwilling to linger any longer, Sir Medric sentenced the guard who had freed Orwile to take his place, and the North Star sought the sea. By the end of 131 AC, Septim Eustace tells us a gray calm had settled over King's Landing and the Crown Lands. Egon III sat the Iron Throne when required, but elsewise was little seen. The task of defending the realm fell to the Lord Protector, Leowen Corbray, the day-to-day -day tedium of rule, to the blind hand, Tyland Lannister. Once as tall and golden-haired and dashing as his twin, the late Lord Jason, Sir Tyland, had been left so disfigured by the Queen's torturers that ladies new to the courts had been known to faint at the sight of him. To spare them, the Hand took to wearing a silken hood over his head on formal occasions. This was perhaps a misjudgment, for it gave Sir Tyland a sinister aspect, and before very long, the small folk of King's Landing began to whisper tales of the malign masked sorcerer in the Red Keep. Sir Tyland's wits remained sharp, however. He might have been expected to have emerged from his torments a bitter man, intent upon revenge. But this proved far from true. Instead, the Hand claimed a curious failure of memory, insisting that he could not recall who had been black and who green, whilst demonstrating a dogged loyalty to the son of the very queen who had sent him to the torturers. Very quickly, Sir Tyland achieved an unspoken dominance over Leowen Corbray, of whom Mushroom says, He was thick of neck and thick of wit, but never have I known a man to fart so loudly. By law, both the Hand and the Lord Protector were subject to the authority of the Council of Regents. But as the days passed, and the moon turned and turned again, the regents convened less and less often, whilst the tireless, blind, hooded Tyland Lannister gathered more and more power to himself. The challenges he faced were daunting, 
for winter had descended upon Westeros and would endure for four long years. A winter as cold and bleak as any in the history of the Seven Kingdoms. The kingdom's trade had collapsed during the dance as well. Countless villages, towns, and castles had been slighted or destroyed, and bands of outlaws and broken men haunted the roads and woods. A more immediate problem was posed by the Dowager Queen, who refused to reconcile herself to the new king. The murder of the last of her sons had turned Alicent's heart into a stone. None of the regents wished to see her put to death, some from compassion, others for fear that such an execution might rekindle the flames of war. Yet she could not be allowed to take part in the life of the court as before. She was too apt to rain down curses on the king or snatch a dagger from some unwary guardsman. Alicent could not even be trusted in the company of the little queen. When last allowed to share a meal with her grace, she had told Jehera to cut her husband's throat while he was sleeping, which set the child to screaming. Sir Tyland felt he had no choice but to confine the Queen Dowager to her own apartments in Magor's Holdfast. A gentle imprisonment, but imprisonment nonetheless. The Hand then set out to restore the kingdom's trade and begin the process of rebuilding. Great lords and small folk alike were pleased when he abolished the taxes enacted by Queen Rhaenyra and Lord Keltigar. With the crown's gold once more secure, Sir Tyland set aside a million golden dragons as loans for lords whose holdings had been destroyed during the dance. Though many availed themselves of this coin, the loans did bring about a rift between the Iron Throne and the Iron Bank of Bravos. He also ordered the construction of three huge fortified granaries in King's Landing, Lannisport's, and Gulltown, and the purchase of sufficient grain to fill them. The latter decree drove up the price of grain sharply, which pleased those towns and lords with wheat and corn and barley to sell, but angered the proprietors of inns and pot shops and the poor and hungry in general. Though he called a halt to work on the gargantuan statues of Prince Aemon and Prince Darien that had been commissioned by Aegon II, not before the heads of the two princes had been carved, the hands set hundreds of stonemasons, carpenters, and builders to work on the repair and restoration of the dragon pit. The gates of King's Landing were strengthened at his command, so they might better be able to resist attacks from within the city walls as well as without. The Hand also announced the Crown's funding for the construction of 50 new war galleys. When questioned, he told the regents that this was meant to provide work for the shipyards and defend the city from the fleets of the Triarchy. But many suspected Sir Tylan's real purpose was to lessen the Crown's dependence on House Valerian of Driftmark. The Hand might also have been mindful of the continuing war in the West when he set the shipwrights to work. Whilst the ascent of Aegon III did mark an end to the worst of the carnage of the Dance of the Dragons, it is not wholly correct to assert that the young king's coronation brought peace to the Seven Kingdoms. Fighting continued in the West through the first three years of the Boy King's reign, as Lady Johanna of Casterly Rock continued to resist the depredations of Dalton Greyjoy's Ironborn in the name of her son, young Lord Lorien. The details of their war lie outside our purpose here. For those who would know more, the relevant chapters of Archmaester Mancaster's Sea Demons, A History of the Children of the Drowned God of the Isles, are especially good. Suffice it to say that whilst the Red Kraken had proved a valuable ally to the Blacks during the dance, the coming of peace demonstrated that the Iron Men had no more regard for them than for the Greens. Though he stopped short of openly declaring himself King of the Iron Isles, Dalton Greyjoy paid little heed to any of the edicts coming from the Iron Throne during these years. Mayhaps because the King was a boy and his hand a Lannister, when commanded to cease his raiding, Greyjoy continued as before. Told to restore the women his Iron Men had carried off, he replied that, quote, 
only drown God may sunder the bond between a man and his salt wives. Instructed to return Fair Isle to its former lords, he replied, Should they come rising back up from beneath the sea, we shall gladly give them back what was once theirs. When Johanna Lannister attempted to build a new fleet of warships to take the battle to the Iron Men, the Red Kraken descended on her shipyards and put them to the torch, and made off with another hundred women in the nonce. The Hand sent an angry reproach, to which Lord Dalton replied, The women of the West prefer men of iron to cowardly lions, it would seem, for they jump into the sea and plead with us to take them. Across Westeros, the winds of war were blowing up the narrow sea as well. The murder of Sharako Lohar of Liz, the admiral who had presided over the Triarchy's disaster in the gullet, proved to be the spark that engulfed the three daughters in flames, fanning the smoldering rivalries of Tyrosh, Liz, and Mir into open war. It is now commonly accepted that Sharako's death was a personal matter. The arrogant admiral was slain by one of his rivals for the favor of a courtesan known as the Black Swan. At the time, however, his death was seen as a political killing, and the Mirish were suspected. When Lys and Mir went to war, Tyrosh seized the opportunity to assert its dominion over the Sepstones. To press that claim, the Archon of Tyrosh called up to Rosilio Rindoon, the flamboyant Captain General who had once commanded the Triarchy's forces against Daemon Targaryen. Rosalio overran the islands in a trice and put the reigning king of the Narrow Sea to death, only to decide to claim his crown for himself, betraying the Archon and his native city. The confused four-sided war that followed had the effect of closing the southern end of the Narrow Sea to trade, cutting off King's Landing, Duskendale, Maidenpool, and Gulltown from commerce with the east. Pentos, Bravos, and Lorath were similarly affected, and sent envoys to King's Landing in hopes of bringing the Iron Throne into a grand alliance against Rosalio and the Quarrelsome Daughters. Sir Tyland entertained them lavishly, but refused their offer. It would be a grave mistake for Westeros to become embroiled in the endless quarrels of the free cities, he told the Council of Regents. That fateful year in 131 AC came to a close with the seas of flame, both east and west of the Seven Kingdoms, and blizzards descending on Winterfell and the north. Nor was the mood in King's Landing a happy one. The small folk of the city had already begun to grow disenchanted with their boy King and little Queen, neither of whom had been seen since the wedding, and whispers about the Hooded Hand were spreading. Though the reborn Shepherd had been taken by the Gold Cloaks and relieved of his tongue, Others had risen in his place to preach of how the king's hand practiced the forbidden arts, drank baby's blood, and was besides a monster who hides his twisted face from gods and men. Within the walls of the Red Keep, there were whispers about the king and queen as well. The royal marriage was troubled from the first. Both bride and groom were children. Aegon III was now eleven. Jehera only eight. Once wed, they had very little contact with one another, save on formal occasions, and even that was rare, as the little queen was loath to leave her chambers. Both of them are broken, Grand Maester Munkin declared in a letter to the Conclave. The girl had witnessed the murder of her twin brother at the hands of blood and cheese. The king had lost all four of his own brothers, then watched his uncle feed his mother to a dragon. These are not normal children, Munkin wrote. They have no joy in them. They neither laugh nor play. The girl wets her bed at night and weeps inconsolably when she is corrected. Her own ladies say that she is eight, going on four. Had I not laced her milk with sweet sleep before the wedding, I am convinced the child would have collapsed during the ceremony. As for the king, the new Grand Maester went on, 
Egon shows little interest in his wife or any other girl. He does not ride or hunt or joust, but neither does he enjoy sedentary pursuits such as reading, dancing, or singing. Though his wit seems sound enough, he never initiates a conversation, and when spoken to, his answers are so curt, one would think the very act of talking was painful to him. He has no friends save for the bastard boy Gaiman Palehair, and seldom sleeps through the night. During the hour of the wolf, he can oft be found standing by a window, a gazing up into the stars. But when I presented him with Archmaester Lyman's Kingdom of the Sky, he showed no interest. Egon seldom smiles and never laughs, but neither does he display any outward sign of anger or fear, save in regards to dragons, the very mention of which sends him into a rare rage. Orwell was wont to call his grace calm and self-possessed. I say the boy is dead inside. He walks the halls of the Red Keep like a ghost. Brothers, I must be frank. I fear for our king and for the kingdom. His fears, alas, would prove to be well-founded. As bad as 131 AC had been, the next two years would be much worse. It began on an ominous note when the former Grand Maester Orwell was discovered in a brothel called Mother's, near the lower end of the Street of Silk. Shorn of his hair, and beard, and chain of office, and going by the name Old Will, he had earned his bread by sweeping, scrubbing, inspecting patrons of the house for pox, and mixing moon tea and potions of tansy and pennyroyal for mothers, daughters, to rid themselves of unwanted children. No one paid Old Will any mind until he took it upon himself to teach some of mother's younger girls to read. One of his pupils demonstrated her new skill to a sergeant in the gold cloaks, who grew suspicious and led the old man in for questioning. The truth soon emerged. The penalty for deserting the Night's Watch is death. Though Orwell had not yet sworn his vows, most still considered him an oathbreaker. There was no question of allowing him to take ship for the Wall. The original sentence of death that Lord Stark had pronounced on him must apply. The Regents agreed. Sir Tyland did not deny this, though he pointed out that the office of King's Justice had yet to be filled, and as a blind man, he was a poor choice to swing the sword himself. Using that for his pretext, the Hand instead confined Orwell to a tower cell, large, airy, and far too comfortable, some charged. Until such time as a suitable headsman can be found, neither Septim Eustace nor Mushroom were deceived. Orwell had served with Sir Tyland on Egon II's Green Councils, and plainly, old friendship and the memory of all they had endured played some part in the Hand's decision. The former Grand Maester was even provided with quill, ink, and parchment so that he might continue his confessions. And so he did for the best part of two years, setting down the lengthy history of the reigns of Viserys I and Aegon II that would later prove to be such an invaluable source for his successor's true telling. Less than a fortnight later, reports reached King's Landing of bands of wildlings from the Mountains of the Moon descending upon the Vale of Arryn in large numbers to raid and plunder, and Lady J.N. Arryn left the courts and sailed for Gulltown to see the defense of her own lands and people. There were ominous stirrings along the Dornish marches too, for Dorne had a new ruler in the person of Aleandra Martell, a brazen girl of ten and seven, who fancied herself the new Nymira, and had every young lord south of the Red Mountains vying for her affections. To deal with their incursions, Lord Caron took his leave of King's Landing as well, hastening back to Nightsong in the Dornish marches. Thus, the seven regents became five. The most influential of those was plainly the Sea Snake, whose wealth, experience, 
and alliances made him the first amongst equals. Even more tellingly, he seemed the only man the young king was willing to trust. For all these reasons, the realm suffered a terrible blow on the sixth day of the third moon of 132 AC, when Corlys Valerian, Lord of the Tides, collapsed whilst ascending the serpentine steps in the Red Keep of King's Landing. By the time Grand Maester Munkin came rushing to his aid, the Sea Snake was dead. Seventy-nine years of age, he had served four kings and a queen, sailed to the ends of the earth, raised House Valerian to unprecedented levels of wealth and power, married a princess who might have been a queen, fathered dragon riders, built towns and fleets, proved his valor in times of war and his wisdom in times of peace. The Seven Kingdoms would never see his like again. With his passing, a great hole was torn in the tattered fabric of the Seven Kingdoms. Lord Corliss lay in state beneath the Iron Throne for seven days. Afterward, his remains were carried back to Driftmark aboard the Mermaid's Kiss, captained by Marilda of Hull with her son Alan. There, the battered hull of the ancient sea snake was floated once again and towed out into the deep waters east of Dragonstone, where Corliss Valerian was buried at sea aboard the very ship that had given him his name. It was said afterwards that as the hull went down, the cannibal swept overhead, his great black wings spread in a last salute. A moving touch, but most likely a later embroidery. From all we know of the cannibal, he would have been more apt to eat the corpse than salute it. The base-born Alan of Hull, now Alan Valarian, had been the Sea Snake's chosen heir, but his succession was not uncontested. It will be recalled that in the time of King Viserys, a nephew of Lord Corliss, Sir Vaymond Valarian, had put himself forward as the true heir to Driftmark. This rebellion cost him his head but he left a wife and sons behind. Sir Vaymond had been the son of the elder of the Sea Snake's brothers. Five other nephews, sired by another brother, had claims as well. When they took their case before the sick and failing Viserys, they made the grievous mistake of questioning the legitimacy of his daughter's children. Viserys had their tongues removed for this insolence, though he let them keep their heads. Three of the Silent Five had died during the dance, fighting for Aegon II against Rhaenyra. But two survived, together with Sir Vaymond's sons, and all came forward now, insisting that they had more right to Driftmark than, quote, this bastard of Hull whose mother was a mouse. Sir Vaymond's sons, Damien and Darien, took their claim to the council in King's Landing, when the Hand and the Regents ruled against them, they wisely chose to accept the decision and be reconciled with Lord Allen, who rewarded them with lands on Driftmark on the condition that they contribute ships to his fleet. Their silent cousins chose a different course. Lacking tongues with which to make their appeal, they preferred to argue with the sword, says Mushroom. However, the plot to murder their young lord went awry when the guards at Castle Driftmark proved loyal to the Sea Snake's memory and his chosen heir. Sir Malentine was slain during the attempt, his brother captured, condemned to death. Sir Rogar saved his head by taking the black. Alan Valerian, the bastard born of Mouse, was formally installed as Lord of the Tides and Master of Driftmark, whereupon he set out for King's Landing to claim the Sea Snake's place amongst the Regents. Even as a boy, Lord Alan never lacked for boldness. The Hand thanked him and sent him home. Understandably, as Alan Valerian was but sixteen in 132 AC. Lord Corliss's seat upon the Council of Regents had already been offered to an older and more seasoned man, Unwin Peak, Lord of Star Pike, Lord of Dustonbury, Lord of White Grove.
As the first half of this chapter comes to a close, we're seeing a continuation of the theme of cleaning up after the Dance of the Dragons. With the large influx of Northmen in the South now, it works out quite well, given that all of the Southern women have had their husbands die in war, or at least a great majority of them, because the dance was so destructive. And with Cregan Stark rejecting his role as Hand of the King, we're also seeing a restructuring of the political structure, given the fact that there is no one clear ruler while Egon is still a child and has to be subject to the regents. They're doing a job of trying to include both blacks and greens, but we do kind of see this edging out as Tyland Lannister seems to be taking on a lot of the power. Kind of an unsuspected person, as he was a rather minor character in the previous chapters, to be coming up and getting a great deal of power. But as the other regents have obligations pulling them off into other directions, this really leaves it wide open for Tylen to kind of assert his authority, and we can see this with his essentially pardoning Grand Maester Orwile after it was discovered that he didn't take the black, but instead was living under a false name at a brothel. I do think it's kind of funny that the only reason that he was caught was because he was teaching prostitutes how to read, and one of the guards found that to be so unbelievable he had to know that something was wrong, so that just kind of made me laugh a little bit. Just kind of further hammering home the point that, I mean, really, the whole Dance of the Dragons was founded on, which is just, women doing anything? Preposterous. But despite Orwile not actually following through with his oath to take the black, we see that he is not executed, and instead, Tyland Lannister uses that influence that he has been gaining to essentially stall, if not completely postpone, his execution. And that is what gives us, I mean, really the entirety of the text that we're going off, because it's Orwell's Confessions, with which Munkin uses to write the documentary of the dance. Otherwise, we would essentially be getting the entirety of the Dance of the Dragon from Mushroom's account, and while I would absolutely love to read that, the book would have a far different tone, and I'm not sure how long my vocal cords could sustain doing Mushroom's voice. I don't know if an hour and a half of uninterrupted reading, I would be able to say anything afterwards. And even further consolidating the power of Tyland Lannister is the death of Corlys Valerian, the last major player in the dance taking his leave of this existence. Uh, presumably it is got to be a heart attack that he suffered, maybe some sort of other illness such as an aneurysm, but you would have to believe that the cardiovascular system is in some way related considering he was collapsed and found dead. Corliss obviously was an old man, but I don't think he would be the type to, you know, fall, break a hip, and just the trauma of that killing him, so I would have to imagine it was something related to his heart if I had to take a guess. But who knows, it could be a combination of the two. Maybe he suffered some sort of uh, heart attack and then fell, and the trauma of that was just too much for his body to handle. Unfortunately, we can't know, considering the extent of medical technology in Westeros is not exactly phenomenal at this time. Another theme that this chapter touches on is the overall trauma that the Dance of the Dragons left, not only on the Targaryens and the royalty and all of the higher-ups involved in it, but the realm as a whole. And this is really exemplified through the way Aegon and his queen are portrayed. They're just depressed. You know, they've been through so much awful, traumatic things that Munkin literally quotes them as being dead inside. And it's easy to believe. I mean, if you look at the way that they're described, it's not a lot of joy going around them. And then you also have Alicent trying to get her daughter to kill Aegon in the night. That's not helping, considering the fact that your mom is essentially crazy now and all the rest of your family is dead. It's easy to see why these wouldn't exactly be the happiest people in the world. And I think that that theme plays out into the rest of the realm as well. There's just this general air of, you know, just this sadness after this big traumatic event happened and really affected everybody. And this really plays into what I think the Game of Thrones books as a whole are trying to say. This vying for power, this political system where the second the king dies, there is this huge gap to come in and just start wars over who is going to be the next in line, a Game of Thrones, if you will. 
it's all set up in a way that it's almost perpetuating this cycle of violence where you have somebody in power, like Jaharis, who has a stable rule and is able to bring a certain amount of control and normalcy to the kingdom, but the second he goes, there's this potential for more violence, more warfare, and it's almost cyclical every time you get a king dying, there's a power vacuum, and that needs to be filled, and usually there's contention around that, and that leads to war. And it really goes to display that all of that warfare, it really just wreaks destruction. There's nothing really to be gained from any of it, despite the power gain of certain people, and most of the time it doesn't even end up with anybody winning, right? I mean, we see both Rhaenyra and Aegon II dying before they're ever actually able to have a real rule, and then Aegon III is just this kind of hollow and depressed husk of a person because of the trauma of all of the war. And even with a lot of the characters and the themes, they're almost cyclical in a way. I mean, there's big correlations between Littlefinger from the Game of Thrones main books and Lord Larry Strong, but most of these stereotype roles you see played out through the various different houses and kind of what their mottos and their belief systems are. As far as the question of succession after Aegon III is concerned is something that is going to be attempted to be addressed in the next half of this chapter, which will be out next week for you guys. But in the meantime, go ahead and let me know what you think. Am I off base with the overall themes that the Game of Thrones books are trying to present, or do you think that it's a fairly accurate summation, as well as your thoughts generally on the chapter, how it's going so far? Thank you guys so much for watching. As always, I do really appreciate the support and the continued viewership, and I will be seeing y'all next week.